hearing about what God is doing, then that should put a, a great smile on your face uh, for sure, and you should be uh, truly delighted. Amen? Amen. Well, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm excited to be back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and if you have need of a Bible, these fine gentlemen will be happy to put one in your hand this morning. If uh, you don't have one of your own and you want to uh, make this one your own, please feel free to take it home with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have been going through, and it's been a couple of weeks. Uh, Dr. Benjamin was here last week. The week before that, we had Easter Sunday here, and so finally we're back in 1 Thessalonians 4. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the issue here in 1 Thessalonians 4 that are very practical issues. And again, you might think back to the time when we looked at that slide that I put up front that had a picture of a, a letter, and you could almost read the letters on the letter, but you couldn't quite make it out. And really, that's what we have as we try to figure out what is Paul trying to address. You see, Timothy, as you may recall, was the discipler who went back to the people there at Thessalonica, and it was his desire to try to mature those believers. He comes back, evidently, with some concerns, and he allows the apostle Paul to know that there are concerns there, and so Paul begins to write. He writes the, the essence of the uh, information dealing with these concerns in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You may recall he dealt with the subject of morality, and he talked about the significance of morality. He also addresses them because they were not sure about the return of the Lord and whether that should, they should keep working, and so some of them had quit working. And so you see that impact here as well uh, later on in chapter 4. By the time we get to verse 13, it seems that there's another issue. And the issue that's impacting the Thessalonians is whether or not those that had died were going to miss out on the kingdom that they anticipated occurring when Jesus would return. No doubt they had understood some things about the resurrection, but not everything. And so the title of the message this morning, Is There Really life after death is one of tremendous significance. Let's notice here two verses, and what we're going to do is we're going to divide this passage, verses 13 through 18, into two different messages, dealing with verses 13 and 14 first today, and then wrapping it up next week with a 13 through 18, dealing with what we know to be the rapture. Verse 13 says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? God, this morning we pray that you would just make clear to us this passage of Scripture. We think about the future, Lord. We think about our lives. We think about the fact that we live here and our life is like a vapor that is soon past. But yet, Lord, we know that we are eternal beings, that our soul will live on, even in a place of righteousness, a place of holiness, a place of blessedness, or a place that was prepared originally for Satan and his angels. So help us, Father, to understand the significance of the resurrection and how important it truly is to us that we might be the kind of disciples that you've called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a story told about a stingy old miser who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness, and he was determined to prove wrong the saying, you can't take it with you. So after much thought and consideration, he finally figured out a way to at least take some of his money with him when he died. He instructed his wife to go to the bank and take out enough cash that he could fill two pillowcases full of cash. He then directed her to take those pillowcases, those bags of money, to the attic and leave them directly above his bed. His plan was this. When he passed away, he would reach out and grab the bags on the way up to heaven. Well, several weeks after the funeral, the deceased miser's wife was up in the attic cleaning, and she came across these two 
big bags full of money. She'd forgotten all about them, but there they were. Oh, that old fool, she exclaimed. I knew he should have had me put the money in the basement. Yeah. The issue of life after death has been one that has obviously been a subject of development over the years. If you stop and you think back to the Garden of Eden and you think back to Adam and Eve before the fall and before the temptation, there was no such thing as death. God had created Adam and Eve with a heart that would beat forever. They would breathe in and breathe out forever. But God warned them that if you ate of that one fruit that you would surely, surely die. And we know that death enters into the equation. As God begins to build the people of Israel, he calls Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees and he sets forth the whole plan. You begin to to see how, how things started to take shape. If we go back to the Old Testament passages, we we'll see that even in the Old Testament, as things are developing, and they're they're kind of rudimentary in some ways, but they need to develop, and the whole issue of life after death is just beginning to come into focus. During the periods of history, you see how this begins to unfold. This morning, we need to understand the significance of Jesus' teaching on the subject, and understand how life is impacted by the future resurrection. Think of, me, think of this with me, if you would. Think back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, this whole concept of bodily resurrection begins to evolve from something of a, a vague concept, because certainly Adam and Eve, while there was that, that reference in Genesis chapter three to a future redeemer, everything is not explained, and it's difficult to try to put it all together and, and understand it. One of the oldest books in the Old Testament is the book of Job, and this is what Job said. He said, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. All the way back to the oldest book of the Bible, we find a reference here to the resurrection. By the time we come to the prophets and they're speaking more on that which is uh, more uh, end time related and they're looking at the apocalyptic aspects, you see that they begin to speak more frequently of it. Isaiah would say, your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. And so you're starting to see a little bit more of that. Daniel chapter 12, a great passage of scripture, one that we'll be studying this summer. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 30 says, but everyone will die for his own iniquity. And so you began to see that things began to become a little bit more individual focused. One of the questions that comes up during the early times is the question that sometimes the psalmist will deal with. And that is how do we treat, if there's no resurrection, how how would we treat dealing with evil and the study of evil and understanding that, that some people, and you read back into those imprecatory psalms uh, where they're, they're talking about those who are wicked and they just seem to, to go on and on. Listen, that affects us, doesn't it, today? Uh, your brain travels that direction sometimes, doesn't it? You think to yourself, how in the world is this one who is so wicked prospering? And the psalmist would ask those same questions, and that is one of those questions that that Jesus will deal with. And so the whole aspect of the resurrection and something that is future, a life that is yet to be lived and a life in the future that is impacted by the here and now becomes more and more of a relative focus for us. During the time of the intertestamental period, the Maccabean revolt takes place, it's about 167 BC. And it's told the second of seven tortured brothers responded to the persecutors in his last 
breath of consciousness by saying, you like a frenzy take us out of this present existence, but the king of the universe shall raise us up to eternal life. So there was a view during that period of time as well that there's a future resurrection. But what about the time of Jesus? What did people believe during the time of Christ? Well, one of the things that's going to be impacted is the philosophers and what they believed. The philosophers are trying to pull it all together. They're trying to, to, to offer suggestions. And since no one has ever died and, and looked it over and come back among them, uh, some of them were very, very negative in their view of a future resurrection. Some of them were actually quite hopeless. Notice as we read here, once a man dies, common thought, there is no resurrection. There's no resurrection. And Solomon himself dealt with this, didn't he, in Ecclesiastes, as he tries to battle through some of these things. You remember the, uh, the, the verse that says, better is a living dog than a dead lion? Well, the truth of the matter is, a lion trumps a dog every day of the week, sorry, uh, and it was viewed that dogs were very low on the totem pole. They were really at the bottom. But a lion, he was grandiose. But if the lion's dead, the dog trumps him. That was the idea. Solomon's trying to put it all together. Notice these other philosophers, Theocritus. There is hope for those who are alive, but those who have died are without hope. Catalyst says, when once our bright light sets, there is one perpetual night through which we must sleep. These are encouraging, aren't they? You go, to the, you go to the tombstones and you look at the tombstones, the epitaph, this is my favorite epitaph. This is, just, this is just terrible. I was not. I became. I am not. And I care not. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just like, whew, okay. So these philosophers, and, and, and you think of it, it, it here, is, here is all of this teaching that is going on, and then you've got people like Jesus who's coming on the scene. And you see with Jesus' teachings that his teachings are revolutionary. And we've talked about this in the past. We've talked about the fact that Jesus addresses certain issues that really turn the world upside down. Well, one of the areas that Jesus begins to teach on that really does turn things on its head is the whole aspect of the future and living life with the future in mind. When Jesus came on the scene, there was a ruling group of Jewish leaders in Jerusalem called the Sanhedrin. They were made up of two different groups stemming from different families and so forth. And the first group was the Pharisees. The Pharisees were part of the Sanhedrin and the other part of the Sanhedrin was the Sadducees. The Sadducees were different than the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in a literal resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. They did not believe in the spirit life. They did not believe that there was any type of future resurrection. The Sadducees cast that whole idea of hope out the window, and you see, that's why they were Sadducees. And that is a great way to remember that. <laughs> Some things come back from sixth grade. When Jesus comes on the scene, he begins in his teaching to balance some of those concerns out. For instance, in Psalm chapter 49, and we don't have time to go there, he points out in Psalm chapter 49, the, the, the psalmist writes, and he says that all die, the wise and the fool. The fools are appointed to shield, that is that synonym for death or the grave, and their forms will decay in the grave. The fools cannot continue in their replendence of material possessions, therefore the psalmist says, don't be over odd when a person gets rich. He can't take anything with him when he dies anyway. And even though it's not a direct relation to the study of evil, the psalmist is showing that there is something future and there is a balancing out that will take place. 
So Jesus begins to teach, and he begins to teach with the future in mind. And it's a different type of, of teaching. In fact, when you, when you come to the point in Jesus' ministry, Jesus is going to talk about, for instance, the rich man and Lazarus. We don't have time to, to go there and pull that whole thing apart, but you remember the rich man is sitting at his table and he's eating these sumptuous meals. I mean, we're talking chicken parm and some really good stuff. While Lazarus is, you know, the, that poor man, and he's under the table and he's looking for the crumbs that fall off of the garlic bread. And as it happens, Jesus is teaching and he says they both died. And you have Lazarus who is now in the bosom of Abraham. And there, that whole realm of the dead, Sheol, as it were, is separated. There's a dividing line. And on one side you have Lazarus and he's being comforted and nourished. And on the other side you have the rich man who had everything going for him in life and yet he is in a place of torment. In this way, Jesus is teaching that in the end, justice is carried out. Things do work out. And Jesus is going to teach then that there is more to life than just the here and now. You see this forward thinking in Jesus. When Jesus is beginning to teach there about laying up treasures in heaven, I like to go over there to, to Matthew chapter six, for it's in Matthew chapter six, a, a famous passage of scripture, where Jesus teaches uh, the crowd that is gathered here that it's more about life today. There's something to look forward to, and there's something to work towards. In chapter six, in verse 19, Jesus would say this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, Jesus' teachings were different. They were ch he was challenging us to take a look at the future, because indeed there would be one. We're not going to just pass away with nothing else in mind. Some of the Greek philosophers taught that. They taught basically there was nothing left in life, and if there's nothing left after living this life, doesn't it make the most amount of sense to live life 100 miles an hour in any way that pleases you? I remember when I walked the beat as a policeman, there was a liquor store. It was called the Epicurean. You know who the Epicureans were? Eat, drink, and be merry pretty much sounds, you know, sums it up. That's what they were interested in. Hey, there's nothing else after this life, and so let's just go full bore, and let's enjoy everything that we can. And that often pervades the thinking of people in our society today, does it not? And oftentimes, even people in the church can become compelled in their own mind to live for today without much thought of tomorrow. And yet, Jesus' teachings are all about tomorrow. None of the other religious leaders that have ever come and gone in all of the false religions of time and history have ever been able to claim the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is the principal tenant in the New Testament. The retelling of the empty tomb takes place in all the four Gospels, and it's something that is so prominent that we dare not miss it. Its significance is overwhelming. You see, it's all about Jesus coming again. John chapter 14, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, Jesus said, come again. You see, the resurrection and the return of Christ go hand in hand. By the time we come to the resurrection and the Thessalonians, what did they know? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 would tell us that there will be a resurrection and it's going to take place after its own order. Now, this is an important passage of Scripture. It says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. You're familiar with this, the first fruits of those who are asleep. 
And he says, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also those who are in Christ all will be made alive. But notice that last little part there that I've highlighted, but each in his own order. There are different resurrections at different times. And this is probably what has the Thessalonican believer somewhat confused. By the time we go back there, and you can go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, the apostle is writing, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed. We don't want you to be ignorant of this. It's a negative formula, but it's actually used in a positive way here. We wish you to know concerning them who are asleep. He uses a participle here denoting continuous action. I would translate it this way, those falling asleep from time to time. There are those who are passing away. And the question is, what happens to them? In the mind of the Thessalonians, no doubt they had some knowledge that there would be a future resurrection. But the question is, what happens to these who are dying before the return of the Lord? Are they going to miss out on the kingdom? Are they going to miss out on all of those spiritual blessings and the promises that are made? What's going to be their outcome? You see, it hasn't been fully developed. All of this eschatology has not been fully developed in the mind of the Thessalonians. They're trying to figure it out. And Paul is trying to make sure that they're not ignorant or misunderstanding what is going to take place. You see, they needed to know because Paul is going to go on and he is going to tell them that these people have fallen asleep. The word asleep there is a euphemism. It's actually um, a, a word that didn't originate with Christians. It was common among Jews. It was common even among pagans. It was even viewed as, the, as reality for those who didn't even believe in a resurrection. And, and there was a term, though, that's much more at home with Christians when you start talking about a Christian who's passed away as being asleep. And so for Christians, Christians used to use this one particular Greek word. It's actually the Greek word where we get the word uh, dormitory or cemetery from. You see, a, a cemetery was a place that just temporarily housed the body. That's where we get that word cemetery. Koimetaria. You can go to churches, and I love those old churches, you know, the old white church with the big steeple out in the country, and it's got a like, white little picket fence around the back, and there's the, the tombstones of some of the people who used to attend the church, maybe some pastors, and deacons, and piano players, and Sunday school teachers, and just regular parishioners, and, and they're buried right in the back, and it's, it's, it's a dormitory for their bodies. And that's how they looked at it, and that's how we should look at it. It's a temporary dwelling place, and, and God has something spectacular coming. Take your Bibles and go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All right, who stole all my minutes? Ay, ay, ay. We're just getting to the best part. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is going to write here, and he's going to say in verse 1, for we know that if the earthly tent which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God. If the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. The earthly tent that the Apostle Paul is speaking about here is a temporary dwelling place. I don't know about you, but if I have the alternative to either live in a tent or live in a house, I'd rather live in a house. You with me? Was the wind blowing at your house last night? I mean, seriously. I, how many of you have ever been in a tent before? You stayed overnight in a tent? I remember I got a tent. Somebody gave me a tent. It was one of those old uh, you know, canvas tents. It made a good tarp in the back of the car. Um, but that, that, that tent, my, I talked my best friend into going and, and alongside of the house, sleeping out overnight. And we, we got some food and everything. And it, this, this tent didn't have one of those bottoms in it. It was just like we're laying on the ground in dirt. And... It was so exciting, you know, we sat there and we were telling stories and we were up on our elbows and looking out and, and uh, a skunk came walking by. 
I'm telling you what, we let that skunk get out of view. We turned beat feet and got into the house, okay? I would much rather be in a house. I was in Africa teaching a couple years ago, had the opportunity to, after all the teaching was done, to go out uh, to this safari place for an overnight. And we stayed in a building that was built on a, a cement foundation, and it was a tent on top of that foundation. I wasn't wild about that. All I can think of is those malaria-carrying mosquitoes finding its way as this tent just laid on the cement, and there were places where they could get through. I'm sure of it, and I, I went over, and I didn't have any duct tape, and, and I thought, oh, this is terrible, and, and then I thought of snakes, vipers, and we'd been through the snake house earlier that day. There are like a thousand different kinds of snakes that'll kill you in Africa. And I thought, oh, this is terrible. You see, I was longing for a house. Don't they have some real place for us to stay? Paul writes here and he says, we, knew that, we know that our earthly tent, that's speaking here of our bodies, our physical body, and he views it as an earthly tent, is going to be torn down. But we have a building from God. It's a house not made with hands. It's not an earthly house. It's not an earthly body. But he says that it's eternal. It's not made with hands. It's eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in all this house, we groan. In this house that we live in, there are groans, aren't there? Uh, there are pains. Uh, there are difficulties. But he's looking at it and he says, we are longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. As a believer, I look forward to my glorified body. I look forward to that new body. I, I look forward to it for many different reasons. It'll never have to go on a diet. <laughs> it has no sin nature attached. Woohoo! That's, that's the trump card right there, right? It'll never die. You see, this body that I'm going to receive is eternal, not made with hands. You see, it, it, it's suitable for where I'm going to be living. I, I, I can't go to the moon and just jump out of the spaceship and walk around and live there. I can't live with this sinful body in a holy place that is God's abiding place. And so what Paul has to say here is incredibly significant. Notice with me in 1 Corinthians, just turn a couple more pages towards the front of your Bible from that passage in 2 Corinthians. You come back here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51, the apostle Paul is going to write here, behold, he says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all will be changed. All will be changed. There needs to be a change that takes place in my body. He is going to say here that this change needs to occur. In a moment, he says, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. He says it twice, we will be changed. You see, the problem is this perishable body that I have has to put on an imperishable body. When you go to the grocery store, they have food that's a day old. I'm getting to that point. You buy something and it says right on the container, use by a certain date. There's an expiration date, right? Right? It's because it's perishable. The milk you buy today won't be drinkable in a month. It's perished. Your physical body and my physical body are truly perishable. And I am going to go to a place where I am going to live forever with Jesus, my Savior. And I can't live forever here. Never mind there. And so what has to occur is there needs to be a change. And this is what Paul is saying. We must all be changed. You can't live in your physical body the way it's made now in heaven for all eternity. 
It needs to be incorruptible. The mortal must put on immortality. This is what he says here in verse 54, but when this perishable will have put on imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see, something has to happen here. This mortal body needs to put on immortality. That is, you can live forever. It's, it's, it's more than an Avengers movie, okay? This is, this is more than Captain Fantastic. But you see, you and I need to be able to live forever. I am going to be immortal someday. There were times in my life when I was younger that I felt immortal. I don't feel immortal anymore. I am totally mortal. I am a mortal being, and so are you. And we need to have an immortal body, a house that's made to build, or built to last forever in order to be able to enjoy what God has for us. And it's only when this body is transformed that the saying can be completed, death is swallowed up in victory. When I go through that wormhole and and I pass from this life to the next, I am going to come out the other side, woohoo, saying death is swallowed up in victory because death will not be able to contain me because the resurrection of Jesus Christ brings new life to every single one of the children of God, those who are in Christ, as we go through that process of dying. The process of death is something that I don't see spoken of in Scripture as being horrible. I know Psalm 23, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, God says, I'm with you. Uh, Sometimes people cringe when they stop to think about death, and yet the inevitability should not be lost on us. This is something that has to happen in order for me to be able to put on that immorality immortality, I need to be able to be imperishable. And that is going to happen when I get to the other side. I I don't see any places in scripture where God is warning me, look out, Kevin, when it's time to die, it's going to be terrible, or it's going to be terrifying, and don't you worry about it. The scripture doesn't talk about it that way at all. Have you noticed that? It it is part of a a transformation that must take place in the life of all of us who are following Jesus Christ. The Thessalonian believers needed to know that death was going to be part of this experience for most Christians. But it was not something to be feared. It was not something to be dreaded because it is ushering us into the best time of our life. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was hung less than two weeks before the Allies got to the prison camp where he was. If he could have hung on there two more weeks, he'd have been all set, but he knew that Hitler had it out for him. He was involved in a backdoor plot to assassinate Hitler, and Hitler was making sure that his enemies were taken care of before he died. And so Bonhoeffer had the opportunity to stop and contemplate death from a very real perspective in the weeks leading up to that execution. I wrote down what he has to say about it. I've put it up on my bulletin board in my office, and I read this statement frequently. He says this, he says, no one has yet believed in God and the kingdom of God. No one has yet heard about the realm of the resurrected and not been homesick from that hour, waiting and looking forward joyfully to being released from bodily existence. Whether we're young or old makes no difference. What are 20 or 30 or 50 years in the sight of God? And which of us knows how near he or she may already be to that goal? That life only really begins when it ends here on earth. That all that is here is only the prologue before the curtain goes up. That is for young and old alike to think about. He goes on, he says, why are we so afraid when we think about death? Death is only dreadful for those who live in dread and fear of it. Death is not wild and terrible. If only we can be still and hold fast to God's word. 
Death is not bitter if we have not become bitter ourselves. Death is grace. The greatest gift of grace that God gives to people who believe in him. Death is mild. Death is sweet and gentle. It beckons to us with heavenly power. If only we realize that it's the gateway to our homeland, the tabernacle of joy, the everlasting kingdom of peace. How do we know that dying is so dreadful? Who knows whether in our human fear and anguish we are only shivering and shuddering at the most glorious, heavenly, blessed event in the world? Death is hell and night and cold if it's not transformed by our faith. Listen to that. Death is hell, it's night, it's cold if it's not transformed by our faith. But that's what is just so marvelous, that we can transform death. More accurately, it's God who transforms the death. And Jesus' statements about the resurrection, I am the resurrection and the life, he that believeth in me, yet shall he live, rings true. Do you believe in faith in Christ Jesus? Do you have that assurance in your heart that there is an eternity in heaven waiting for you? Have you made that decision to put your faith and trust in him? You see, there are two places. And your decision about Jesus Christ will determine where you spend your eternity. But it doesn't have to be a negative You can today put your faith in Jesus and have the assurance that you are going to spend eternity with him in heaven. To the Thessalonians, they needed to know and understand that indeed there is life after death. There is something great to look forward to. And those who died before the return of Jesus have nothing to worry about, and we'll talk about that more next week. Let's stand, we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we are so blessed to know that we have eternal life. That our faith, Lord, in Jesus is what saves us and not our faith in ourselves or in the works that we might do. Father, you have been merciful to us by sending your son Jesus to come and conquer death through the power of the resurrection. Father, truly, we are a blessed people having received from you the greatest reward. How we thank you, Lord. Father, I pray today if there's anyone here who's not sure of their eternal destination that today they would make certain that their faith is in Jesus and in Jesus alone. May we be emboldened, Lord, as we go about living our life. May we lay up treasures in heaven. May we truly be focused, Lord, on eternity and live, Lord, a life that's desiring to please you in all things. Work in and through us, I pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Have a blessed week.